Drafting Archetypes is sponsored by Grey Viking Games. Check them out at greyvikinggames.com and use our code DRAFT10 for 10% off. Hi everyone, this is Sam Black. Uh, welcome to Drafting Archetypes. This week we are going to be discussing green-white in Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. For anyone who is a patron of Drafting Archetypes, my notes for this episode uh, are available on patreon.com slash draftingarchetypes to uh, limited guru and above level patrons. So if you have that or are interested in signing up and want to follow along, pull up those notes now. For this week, I'm going to talk about green-white. I started with red-black because I feel like it's the most important archetype to understand in the format because it's the most powerful, most played, winningest. Even if you don't want to draft it, you need to know what's going on with it, because most of your opponents, well, not most, but a plurality of your opponents will be drafting it. It provides a lot of context for like what you are going to need to face and what you're trying to beat in the format, even when you aren't drafting it. So with that in mind, green-white is... I don't want to say that it's like really the foil to red-black, because... Red Black still seems to be favored, but as uh, Sirkovich went over, I believe today for me, recently for people listening in the future on Twitter and on his own stream, uh, Green White is allegedly the archetype that has the best win rate against Red Black. Also, uh, just one of the stronger archetypes, in my opinion, and an archetype that I've uh, had success with on my stream the last few days. I've trophied with it twice, um, so you can... Check the VODs if you're interested in seeing some drafts uh, that were successful with Green White. Before I get into anything else, I just want to touch on a really weird little note that follows from the mention about uh, Sirkovich's coverage of Green White, which is that uh, Sirkovich has access to kind of more depth of data and 17 lands than uh, the average consumer. And went over stuff like the cards that have the best win rate against red black and the card the single card in the format that won the most won at the highest rate when drawn against red black was your ambushed on the road it gives a creature plus one plus two or returns a creature you control to its owner's hand which is the fifth best white common in green white which is to say it's a card that is probably better than a lot of people think it is. It's not played anywhere near that much. Not an especially good card. Um, it's, you know, it's not a bad card. It's fine to put it in your deck, uh, even ignoring the fact that it's specifically good against red, black. But like, even though it wins a lot against red, black and red, black shows up a lot, its stats still aren't that good. Despite all of that, it manages to win more than all the super powerful mythics, just every great card. If nothing else, the card that overperforms most against red black, but also just, you know, really a, just a card to think about and maybe take or play a little bit more often. It's certainly a card that you'll have the option to play and you might want to take advantage of that somewhat more often than you might otherwise. As far as why that's so good against red black, obviously it um, the plus one plus three part is going to generally counter most red removal spells. Uh, by getting you more enough toughness that it's not going to kill you. And then if that doesn't work, you can dodge any removal spell or price of loyalty by picking up your creature. You can also get some, you know, plenty of favorable combats with the combat trick side of it. And then obviously the fact that it's one mana has to just be very important for it to win at that rate. That That speaks to kind of like the green-white against red-black matchup is reasonably tempo-based and certainly involves them having a lot of removal. Also, some portion of the time they're using removal on a creature that you control that has an interest battlefield ability. Theoretically, that could happen with Priest of Ancient Lore, though they're not often going to use removal on that. More likely, something like Owlbear or uh, Hill Giant Herd Gorger or even Eltigard Ranger. All of these are you know expensive cards that have a good interest battlefield ability, and when your opponent uses a removal spell on them, uh, if instead of it dying, you pick it up and cast it again, you get the enters the battlefield ability again. That's a really big 
difference, especially if they were going to be taking it with price of loyalty and sacrificing it. Now, instead of getting to hit you for a lot of damage and then potentially sacrificing it for value or not just getting rid of it, now you're getting its entry to the battlefield ability again and saving it and saving all that life. So definitely something to watch out for, especially the more big stuff you're playing. I think that there are several different ways to draft red black in terms of like, are you more like low to the ground aggro or are you more like grindy big stuff control with a lot of late game? Green white is strong because it um, can also exist at a lot of different points in the curve and uh, prioritize different game plans. The more you're doing that big stuff, I think the more important it is to have uh, ambush on the road so that you don't get really destroyed by your, you know, those expensive cards getting killed or especially stolen. So let's talk about what green white is doing well, what cards are putting you into green white, what you're looking for, what this archetype's about. So obviously on its surface, like when you read the cards, like the thing that it's doing, like it's, it's kind of like synergy space is in life gain. And that really shows through in its top performing uncommons in particular. Best performing uncommon in green white being Prosperous Innkeeper, which is the 1-1 one, one for 2 that makes a treasure when it enters the battlefield and gives you a life whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control. Second best performing uncommon is Cleric Class. That's the one white mana class enchantment that gives you an extra life whenever you gain life. And then for four mana, you can make it start putting counters on your creatures when you gain a life. And then for five mana, you can return a creature from your graveyard to the battlefield and gain life equal to its toughness. The card does a lot of different work at every stage. Um, increasing your life gain doesn't really have any other synergies. Like it doesn't increase your triggers. There are a lot of things that care about life gain, but none of them care about how much life you gain. But it does just buy you extra time. And then the second stage is kind of really the big payoff where all of your gain life triggers start making your creatures bigger. And then like that's kind of the engine that you're there for. But then the third stage where you get to return a creature is, you know, now you're plus a whole card, plus you got a trigger, plus you got whatever enters the battlefield ability you had on that. And just a really, really powerful effect. The, the, the whole package there is super powerful in a deck that has other ways to gain life. Next up is Lurking Roper, another life gain payoff. This is green two for a four or five um, that doesn't untap during your untap step, but does untap whenever you gain life. Four or five for four is absolutely massive in this format and being absolutely massive is fantastic against all of the powerful aggressive creatures. This is just a really strong card. When you start to have enough life gain, it functions as a uh, four or five vigilance for three rather than four or five doesn't untap like four or five defender. Like when you change four or five defender to four or five vigilance, it's a really big swing of card quality. And then the next best performing, it's actually a tie between uh, Trellisara, the uh, green white legend that's a two two for green white that when you gain a life, you put a plus one plus one counter on it and scry one. And then Hunter's Mark, which is the uncommon instant where you give a creature and you control a plus one plus one until end of turn, and then it deals damage equal to its power to a creature you don't control. And then if that's blue, it only costs one mana instead of four. So Trellisara is another life gain payoff. So the, the top three and a half, four, however you want to count the tie there. Cards and uh, uncommons in green white are all dedicated to this life gain strategy. Um, creature or Planeswalker on Hunter's Mark, sorry. Then the next best performing uncommons are not life gain synergy cards. They're just good cards. White Dragon. And then the next couple are really interesting to me. Portable Hole, which is narrow enough removal spell that can be a little bit tricky to evaluate. Um, in some limited formats, this would be pretty good. In some formats, it would not be that good. Here, one and two mana creatures are really important. There are a lot of them that are really good. So... Basically, every deck does have one, one and two mana creatures you can kill with this. Small note, there's a little bit of a liability against Plundering Barbarian here, um, but it does enough stuff overall that it's you know still worth playing. I, I would say that it's nowhere near as exciting as the other uncommons that I've gone over, but solid card. And then right below that, you meet in a tavern. This is an interesting card to discuss because... 
uh, in the format as a whole, it actually has pretty bad stats. I would generally not recommend playing it. It performs like worse than most decks that it's in on average, but it does actually perform better than like green white, like green white wins more when you draw you meet in a tavern than when you don't, it has an improvement when drawn. It's, the, the stats indicate that this is actually a card you want. And that makes some amount of sense when you consider that the three of the top four uncommons in green white are creatures that specifically have synergy with each other. And a lot of the cards that you want are cheap creatures that are very good at buying you time, which means that you can get down, you, you end up in a spot where you've played your creatures, you're ahead on board, you have plenty of time, plenty of life, so you can afford to take four mana off to draw more creatures, and those creatures are you know gonna be better than some of their cards because when you assemble more of these creatures, you're assembling more little synergies between them. Also, your deck is just like fairly creature heavy with creatures that have on average more toughness than power or like replace themselves where they draw a card or maybe venture when you play them or something and you end up getting like additional value. So it's not hard for this deck to end up in a pretty wide board stall where of course the other side of you meet in a tavern can be powerful. So despite the fact that I think in any other green deck you meet in a tavern is a little bit uh, slow and underpowered. It is actually, according to the stats at least, and in a way that logically makes sense to me, good in green-white. I, I have not personally played it here. The other uncommons that perform above average in the color combination are Choose Your Weapon, which is the three mana combat trick that can double creature's size or deal five to a flyer, and Intrepid Outlander, which is the two mana two three reach with uh, pack tactics venture that's the exhaustive list of above average uncommons, highlights obviously being the top few, and then since the top four uncommons all want you to do this life gain thing, obviously the way that you end up drafting this deck and prioritizing life gain stuff is generally when you have any of those uncommons, you'll start looking to collect them all, find as many of the, those uncommons as you can, also druid class, also the commons that gain life, especially Steadfast Paladin, um, but potentially uh, some weaker cards that get okay if you have enough synergies like Sylvan Shepherd or Inspiring Bard or Dawnbringer Cleric. That's the stuff that puts you here and what you're trying to do with it. Now let's talk about most of the cards that you are looking to use to do it being the best commons. The common that you should be taking most highly in this archetype, the common with the highest game in hand win percentage and a lot of synergies, obviously Priest of Ancient Lore, white two for a two one ETB draw a card, gain a life. The common with the second highest win rate surprised me somewhat, which is you hear something on watch. That's one in a white to deal five damage to an attacker or give all of your creatures plus one plus one until end of turn. Really flexible, powerful card, uh, two mana to kill an attacker. Like, deal five to an attacker kills most attackers, so this is generally going to be two mana to kill an attacker, which is certainly better rate than we got for years historically, uh, kind of par for the course in recent sets. But then this also has the secondary mode where you can use it on offense, get a lot of value out of it if uh, you have a lot of creatures in play, which obviously as discussed with you being a tavern is somewhat likely to happen with this deck especially when you're on the more controlling version of this deck where you're just like looking to buy time for some of the larger creatures here. Basically, one way to play this deck is just all in synergy, find every life gain card you can. When this is open and a lot of the good uncommons are open, that's really what you want to do. You just want to like really, really maximize that. Sometimes uh, you're not seeing a lot of that, and you're seeing more like ETB value creatures, especially Priest of Ancient Lore and Owlbear. And then you're kind of just looking to like grind people out and just like generally just go like, okay, here's a creature that you have to deal with that didn't cost me anything, uh, didn't cost me a card, and then like do more of that. You hear something on watch is really, really good in that second version of this deck, where because you're getting card advantage from these like ETB creatures, 
um, you're really happy to have a cheap one for one that'll buy you time to play more owl bears. Then it's going to be less good in the like high synergy deck where you don't really want to draw a one for one that's not contributing to your synergy because your cards are all better than more of them you have working together. I guess kind of the distinction here is it plays really well into the small game versus large game distinction that I talked about in the past, where Owlbear is a card, while it makes the game larger because it draws a card, it plays better in small games. Um, it's kind of just a powerful self-contained threat, and the smaller the game is, the uh, more impact getting up that one card is. So Owlbear wants you to be doing a lot of trading and making the game small. Whereas a card like Celestial Unicorn, the three mana, three, two, that gets a plus one, plus one counter whenever you gain a life, wants a big game in that it wants you to have a bunch of other things that work with it that are gaining life and making it bigger. And as long as you have enough synergy for it, it can you know attack into a lot of your opponent's creatures because it gets so big. The same is true of all the other synergy stuff where because it all wants to be working together, it just wants you to have a lot of pieces. And that's something that happens in a large game. So there's kind of like big game green-white and small game green-white where the small game is more attrition-y, the big game is more engine-y. And you hear something on watch, small game card, not big game card. Really high win rate, but not necessarily to be prioritized that highly in all versions of the deck. Next up, Veteran Dungeoneer, which is good rate. You're not even especially interested in venturing as a primary game plan or anything, but three mana for a three four with a solid value ETB is just good enough that the card performs well. That wins only barely more than Steadfast Paladin, which is the two mana two two lifelink. I would note that I personally would prioritize Steadfast Paladin over Veteran Dungeoneer when drafting at almost all points in the draft in green-white, unless it's very, very clear that I have um, an unusually low amount of life gain synergies, and I'm more in the, like, you hear something on watch kind of deck. If there's any chance that I'm going to be looking for life gain synergies as a priority, I'm going to be prioritizing Steadfast Paladin over Veteran Dungeoneer. Next most winning common is your ambushed on the road, uh, which I've already discussed. At this point, I want to point out that every single one of these top five uh, commons in green-white are white. That should just tell you that you should expect to be uh, base white rather than base green most of the time, and maybe says something about uh, the relative power level of the colors, but that's not especially relevant for, you know, when you know that you're drafting this archetype. The next four are all green. That's uh, Spoils the Hunt, which is the three mana creature you control deals damage equal to its power to a creature you don't control instant. Also, it gets plus one plus over each treasure you spend, but you're not going to be doing a lot of that in green white. Followed by Altigard Ranger, which is the 4-1 um, reach ETB make a 2-2. Kill Giant Bird Gorger, which is the 7-6 seven, six for 6 ETB gain 3. And Owlbear, which is the 4-4 four, four draw card trample. For five. All of those have really, really similar win rates. It's interesting somewhat that Elthigard Ranger wins more than Owlbear. I think I and likely most others consider Owlbear the stronger card overall. Ranger does win only 0.2% more, so I would take that stat with a grain of salt. Currently, most of the time, I think that I would be prioritizing Owlbear ahead of the Ranger, but I could be wrong about that. Stats disagree. Follow your heart on that one. You know, think about your own experiences there. Be the tiebreaker since, you know, stats and I disagree and it's fairly close. Next up, Celestial Unicorn, obviously. Actually, I should talk about Celestial Unicorn. So this is a three mana two toughness creature, which is a category of creature that I was very uh, down on in uh, Strixhaven because... There are just a lot of ways that your opponent could punish you for spending three mana for a two toughness creature, like by using a one mana removal spell on it. And this format has similar concerns where, you know, like Dragonfire exists and trades up, and then somewhat more importantly, Improvised Weaponry and Precipitous Drop both can kill three toughness creatures while generating value. However, both of those are sorcery speed. So if you can gain life the turn that you play Celestial Unicorn, it gets a third toughness, and then neither one of those answer it. 
So celestial unicorn's liability of cost of having two toughness is greatly mitigated if you uh, are good at gaining life when you play it. So if you have something like Prosperous Innkeeper, Steadfast Paladin, those those are the most likely to, but uh, just pay attention to anything that you might have that would get a counter in it right away so you don't have to um, expose yourself to uh, giving your opponent value off those things. Also, uh, this is comparable to something like Quandrix Pledge Mage, two, three mana, two toughness creature that grows over time. Same situation as the Unicorn. Unicorn is easier to cast than a like Quandrix Pledge Mage if you are not exactly Quandrix. And also, you know, starts with an extra power. And if your deck is good at enabling the life gain thing, it's a lot easier to generate a board where you're triggering gain of life a lot. That, that's much easier to set up than where you're uh, mage crafting a lot. So the ceiling on Unicorn is higher than the ceiling on Quadrix Pledge Mage. And then the floor is kind of also higher in that it, you know, guaranteed just has an extra power of stuff. I do think it's a stronger card when you're doing its thing than Quadrix Pledge Mage is. Obviously, you don't always do its thing well. And, you know, like if you just have like a few Priest of Ancient Lores and Hill Giant Herd Gorgers, like one shot life gain um, is not going to make me value it. Celestial Unicorn very highly, whereas Prosperous Innkeeper is absolutely huge here. Steadfast Paladin is very good. Uh, Sylvan Shepherd is very good. You, you're really looking for that repeated life gain to determine whether or not Celestial Unicorn is going to be a priority for you. The final card in green and white that has an above average win rate, so a uh, game in hand win rate higher than the average game in hand win rate, higher than the average win rate overall for green white is much to my surprise potion of healing that's one in a white artifact etb draw a card white cap sack gain three life i've never really understood why i would play this if i don't have teleportation circle unless i just have like a ton of gain life triggers and even if it's just a bunch of gain life triggers it's still really a lot of mana so you get that but the card does pretty well so what do i know I don't understand what's happening with this card well enough to explain it, just that it does have good stats where I honestly wouldn't expect it to. Next up, the cards that are played the most in this archetype that win less than the average amount. This is in order of how much they're played, not in order of how much they win. Inspiring Bard, which doesn't perform very much worse than average, Followed by Null Hunter, which is worse than Inspiring Bard. It's kind of interesting to me that Null Hunter is like below average. I'm still not going to be sad if I have Null Hunter in my deck, but it is notable that this archetype in general doesn't use it anywhere near as well as like Red Green, obviously, which is about trying to use it with combat tricks and stuff. This is less dedicated to that, and so it's more likely to just kind of like sit around and not contribute to any of your synergies. Minimum Containment, which or Minimus Containment, I don't, I don't remember what it's called. Enchantment that turns something into a treasure. This card performs pretty badly, actually exactly as badly as Sylvan Shepherd. Both of them win 53.6% of the time compared to uh, Green White's average of 55.5. A weak but playable removal spell if you're desperate for a removal spell, but you should certainly be looking to use like Spoils of the Hunt instead. Spare Dagger performs better than containment so like if you have any death touch look to use that instead if you're desperate for removal and then play less than containment and shepherd you have arborea pegasus which i'm a little bit surprised does worse than average i've i had really good experiences with this card in one of my trophy decks where i played two of them and they it really felt like they were winning a lot of games for me like i had some flyers but not a ton and i was making some pretty big ground creatures and jumping them was just very important to um racing and i i was a, like a more aggressive i'd say uh build of green white than than some are i would certainly say the the ceiling on our board i guess this is pretty good in this archetype then Underdark Basilisk, which performs similarly to the Pegasus, and then Dawnbringer Cleric, which actually performs at almost exactly the average game in hand win rate. I personally have, like, for example, preferred uh, Arborea Pegasus to Dawnbringer Cleric. The stats don't support me on that. I mean, honestly, like, the stats don't point to valuing the same cards that I've been valuing or doing the same thing that I've been doing. The stats 
point really to a little bit bigger of a green white deck, a little bit more, you know, of the kind of like attrition control, like trade with your opponent stuff, play big things. Whereas I've had better success with the like all in synergy and more aggressive green white deck. I think that like it is probably the case that the all in synergy aggressive green white deck is just better, but it requires getting those good uncommons. And then if you don't have those good uncommons, aggro cards that you're left with are just not really good enough to want to try to play. Like you don't really want to be like trying to beat your opponent down with Null Hunter in green white. And so when you don't have those top tier uncommons, but you're green white anyway, you end up kind of like falling back into the Owlbear, Herdgorger control kind of space. And then in that kind of space, cards like Arboria Pegasus aren't going to uh, work anywhere near as well, where you're more interested in Dawnbringer Cleric just to like buy time to do the big game stuff. So I, I kind of looked at skeletons for both, where just like one of the skeletons I made just by literally just going down the list of cards that win the most down um so that deck ends up playing uh, and then uh putting two in if the card regularly tables and putting one copy in otherwise so that deck ends up playing like two ambush down the road one potion of healing like here's something i watch one spoils the hunt steadfast paladin dawnbringer cleric priest of ancient lore celestial unicorn veteran engineer inspiring bard a couple of altigard rangers bird gorger and owlbear just a ra- i mean obviously less synergy here because it's just the you know overall cards that win the most a little bit of a top heavy curve for my taste which i guess is you know points out that more expensive cards perform well this is a similar phenomenon to what i saw with red black where the expensive cards played out better than i expected like the the cards that win more statistically suggest a higher curve than i found that i wanted i think I'm inclined realizing this to think about the fact that like, oh, there are actually a bunch of cards at the top that do well. You should probably not play very many of them and then it's good when you draw them. But if you play too many of them, you're likely to just like get run over. And then that supports what I was saying about like, you know, drafting like Steadfast Paladin highly, especially compared to like a uh, veteran engineer or something because there aren't actually that many cheap cards that you want to play. But I do think that having those cards hitting your curve is important. You know, you play some of that big stuff, but I think that I would not prioritize it as high as its win rate suggests just because you don't want too much of it in your deck, especially seeing how similar Eltigard Ranger stats are to Owlbear. Maybe you don't need to go really far out of your way to get an Owlbear because you can get a Ranger pretty easily and it's fine to just play that instead. I do th- think that, you know, at least for myself, after looking at these stats, I intend to continue to prioritize the cheap stuff, um, looking for synergy, looking to have kind of the lowest curve I can get, while acknowledging that I'm not like trying to avoid playing the expensive stuff. And, you know, it's, it's not bad to have rangers, owlbears, herdgorgers in your deck, potentially multiples of them. But I, I, I still want to, um, for myself, prioritize the good early game and not falling behind and then just kind of like have those there um, for you know strength in the late game if that comes up another card that i want to discuss that didn't appear on any of those lists is ranger's hawk one one for one flyer a three tap and tap it in another creature to adventure i believe i played two of these in each of the decks that i have trophied with that are green white in the last couple of days and I had good experiences with them. That I like to have a cheap flying creature that you can uh, put counters from cleric class on. And then also, as I talked about, the games can kind of lead to board stalls here, where you do have some like defensive creatures and some life gain. So like that leads to a game where your life total is higher, which makes it less likely that you know your you or your opponent are going to find profitable like alpha strikes. It makes it a little bit more likely that you're just going to stare at each other. And then I've um, certainly played some games where I end up activating Ranger's Hawk some or a lot. The upside of 1-1 Flyer for like good Battlefield Raptor style beats early in the game that um, can kind of transition into this like mana sync value role later 
has been very worth heaven for me, despite the fact that it's not that played and it's win rate's not that high. I, I don't know what other people are doing wrong with it, but I, I've liked it myself. Then to touch on rares very briefly, the way that I decided to look at the rares this time is I looked at the rares that are most played in green white. So like obviously there are a lot of rares that have really good win rates, but I felt like the rares that were most played in green white are the rares that are most likely to lead you to green white, which is why they end up getting played the most of a bunch of you know, equally powerful-ish rares. Not surprisingly, the rare that is played the most in green white is of course the green white rare, uh, Drist. Obviously, like if you see it, you take it, you draft green white, it ends up in your green white deck. It makes a lot of sense. Followed by ranger class, teleportation circle, which makes sense because, uh, you know, the, like green also has good enter the battlefield abilities to go with your white enter the battlefield abilities. Then frog hemoth and paladin class. All five of those are, you know, really good rares, really good in this archetype. You know, frog hemoth does a little bit of life gain. They're, they're all just super powerful on playing cards. Those are all, you know, good rares to lead to drafting the stack. One thing to look for, uh, Spoils the Hunt and Hunter's Mark are both instant speed cards that allow you to do damage with creatures you control. Um, so if you have Steadfast Paladin, they can give you a life gain trigger in combat, which can then, like, you know, trigger your Celestial Unicorn to grow. So you're potentially, like, killing a thing that's part of a double block and growing your creature, or maybe triggering Cleric class, putting a counter somewhere else. I've uh, taken advantage of that some in the last couple days, and it's uh, led to some really good little blowouts, I guess. So just something to think about when you're drafting and playing with those cards. Reasonably straightforward, I guess. You know, you're, you're clearly... Basically always a creature deck with like just a little bit of removal. You're not prioritizing combat tricks very highly um, outside of the like incidental trick on you hear something on watch and uh, then you're ambushed on the road. Bull Strength, which I think is a pretty good card, especially in red green, doesn't perform very well here. It's not really what you're looking for because you want to be, you know, more just like clean removal in the like small version of the, like the small game expensive card version of the deck synergy stuff in the big game cheap creature synergy version of the deck that's my lecture here let's turn it over to chat for any questions question you mentioned steadfast paladin what other commons are you fighting other archetypes for so i mean you're fighting other archetypes for just like all the you know, good comments. Like every, every white deck wants Priest of Ancient Lore. Every green deck wants Owlbear. With Steadfast Paladin, I think you're particularly fighting red-white, where it really values the keyword because it's playing equipment and then wants to like have that life gain creature to suit up to, you know, do the Kaldheim Story Seeker thing. Whereas like Priest of Ancient Lore is just kind of like generically good um like everyone's everyone who's playing white is going to want it i do think that you know you're going to prioritize steadfast paladin over like more than black white and blue white i guess are going to uh, blue white i say like that because it has the worst stats in the format by a lot it doesn't really you know it, it theoretically does venture things but not very well the common you're not fighting anyone over is celestial unicorn most of your synergies are coming at uncommon so you are fighting people for all of your commons because there aren't commons that are like just for you that you're getting because they're synergy cards, except for Celestial Unicorn and then Steadfast Paladin, except that you're fighting Red White for it. But like for the most part at common, you're just looking for like generically good rate commons and you're going to be fighting anyone who's in your colors for them. Next question. Where do you think green, white most falls short slash how should other colors seek to beat each deck? Kind of a big question, I think. But like, what does green white struggle with? When I have played green white, it's actually just like gone pretty well if things that you're doing are good. Similar to like red black, where it's like, oh well, you can play prey on red black 
by doing this thing because it's doing this thing that's weak against this thing. But it's like, well, actually, there are a couple of different approaches to red black. And if you try to beat one of their like versions of red black, you're kind of like walking into what the other red black deck is doing. Like, I can't say, oh, you can just grind out red black with your like priest of ancient lords and elders because like the red black deck might be getting value off of deadly disputes and skullport merchant. And like, they might just also be like a late game grindy deck. I think that like where green white has failed the most is when you're just kind of like a bunch of vanilla ground guys and your opponent just like has a bigger ground creature than you and you don't really have a great way to break through. A spot where this can really happen is if you're playing against something along the lines of blue-green and they have any of the many blue-green mana sinks that is theoretically the thing that blue-green's trying to do. If they play, you know, just like a hill giant herd gorger and you don't and your creatures are all, you know, random veteran dunge dungeoneers and steadfast paladins and stuff you know once they stabilize for a turn or two and get start spending their mana on their mana sinks that's when they're going to pull ahead which is why you know i think that you want some of that like arborea pegasus rangers hawks type stuff to both um you know in the hawks case be able to like also have your own mana sink and then you know generally just like make it less likely you get bricked by flying over obviously the more of the like synergy stuff you have the more likely it is that you can just like power through any of those blockers rather than getting brick walled. But I think that there are times in green white, if the draft doesn't go super well, that your deck just ends up being a little too vanilla. Kind of the biggest weakness is when you are in that my deck is too vanilla space, you just run into like someone who is also, you know, bodies, but better on a board stall than you are. Could be like anyone with any of the many ways of doing like, persistent evasion or whatever or even just you know like a boros deck that's putting an equipment on a thing and attacking trading off putting it on the other thing attacking trading off understanding that kind of like your biggest weakness is your deck full of creatures and then they can all end up being kind of vanilla-ish especially the ones that are just like etb do something and then they're that that, that was what they did that's kind of why it's like best if you can like prioritize these synergies to not get bricked or just make sure you have you know, some removal or whatever. Also, I think, you know, part of why green white does well against like is the best performing deck against red black, even though it's not the best, per the second best performing deck is I do think that it's specifically good against red black because these like random, like vanilla value dudes that you played are basically always live against them where they're not always live against other green and other white decks that um, might be doing something else to beat you in those board stalls. Uh, next question is about Rally Maneuver, which, and like whether that would be the trick of choice for this deck. I didn't mention it because its stats were not exceptional. It does read to me as like the trick you'd want. In practice, it's pretty expensive and found it a little bit harder than I expected to like get the life gain part to happen right because um you have to target different creatures with the two sides and the extra powers with the first strike and i, I found you know like if you're fighting with one creature you often want the two power in first strike and then you can't also give it lifelink so you need to like actually have two creatures fighting to get the lifelink side of it and then it's like pretty expensive and doesn't pump that much i think it's a card that is high ceiling low floor like the the bad for like the bad state for a three mana combat trick is pretty bad statistically it looks like it ends up operating too close to the floor too often synergy wise it's definitely doing something here if you're there it's something to look for especially if you're like making big creatures that you're going to get a lot of life on the life game i think it's likely being somewhat overrated because of the dream of what it does and then in reality i think you would often rather just be playing an ambush on the road next question why are green white game and hand win rate cards barely at the 58 percent mark Stat-wise, is that a good archetype? It wins 55.5% of the time. It's about an average archetype. And then, like, the winningest commons are still commons. The cards that are going to win a lot more than that are the good rares and good uncommons. That's kind of just the way that things work. A good common in general in, across, like, any draft format is 
rarely going to get much over 58%. I, I wouldn't read a lot into that. Um, obviously, if you've been spending a lot of time studying red black and you're like, well, I'm, I'm used to there being a bunch of cards that win that much. I mean, that's because red black is winning 59% on 17 lands. So just like a lot of cards that aren't necessarily adding a lot are just going to happen to be up there. So like stat wise, is this a good archetype? It's a fine archetype. It's not a broken archetype. It's just, you know, normal. So this is like, you can play it common or should you try not to draft it if you don't see the uncommons in pack one? Yeah, I think that I personally would say that I need an uncommon to get me into this deck. I think that you're just too likely to reach that fail state that I was talking about where you're just like a bunch of vanilla bodies if you don't have one. There are so many good red and black cards at common that are so much better than so many of the green and white commons that it's just really hard to imagine a string of packs where I'm not seeing a high like rarity or like at least an uncommon green or white card where I'm seeing like enough green and white cards that I'm like oh yeah these are the cards I want to be taking like there just aren't enough good cards that are going to put me into a deck for me to end up there without some like strong draw there so yeah I, I don't think that like green white is a archetype you want to force you basically you start you know semi-forcing it when you find one of the good uncommons and then if you get like a second one or something early on then it's just like full speed ahead this is what i'm doing but yeah i, I don't want to just like move in on commons next question is uh that my green white deck last night played paladin shield despite the fact that it has really bad stats um, what was my thinking there and did it work out for me? That was about the fact that I had a lot of steadfast paladins and lurking ropers, and I wanted to be able to get into combat with those steadfast paladins, and then also celestial unicorns, and those were all going to be creatures that were pretty important for my opponent to get off the board, so they were like going to want to block them. They were important for me to keep around, so I wanted to protect them. It's not surprising to me that that card has bad stats, and I don't necessarily advocate playing it a lot in general. It, it was very much a function of, like, this is a very, like, combat-heavy version of this deck, where it's, like, engaging in the kind of combat that's going to lead to blocks, rather than, like, the kind of combat where it's hard for the opponent to block. And I think that that's what has to happen to have any interest in Paladin Shield. Next question, how rare dependent is this color pair in comparison to others? So this is a very similar question to the, like, can you draft this at common question? Though obviously, like, a little bit different in that, you know, rares and uncommons are different things. I think that, you know, the, the rares that I talked about that can lead to this archetype are really, really strong. But I do think that you can easily get by on the top uncommons rather than the top rares. Uh, as I said, I do think that you need higher rarity cards to put you into this deck, but I think that as long as you have a few of the uncommons and uncommons that support the synergies that they're looking for, uh, you can be successful without rares. It takes, you know, the rares do a lot more and are a lot better. Um, it takes fewer of them to get to the point where you have a winning deck, and rares are very important in this format, um, especially in an archetype where, you know, fully admittedly the commons are unlikely to get there by themselves. Rare or uncommon, like if you have enough of either one of them, you're going to be in good shape. Next question, do you think you can splash in this archetype from venturing? Somewhere between no and hard no. I think that it's very hard to splash in this archetype. Uh, the only way you're really making a treasure is with Prosper's Innkeeper, and you're only uh, making a treasure if you choose to on like the second path on that dungeon, uh, the mines or whatever. And you're really not reliably going to venture twice early. You're not really eager to make a treasure when you do. This is just like very much not a like dedicated venturing deck. So I, I wouldn't splash anything that's not really, really amazing um, off of trying to use venture for a treasure to do it. Um, unless, you, unless you happen to be in a particularly unusual version of this deck that has a lot of venture stuff, I, I wouldn't really expect that to be like as much as I think that that's a thing in the format in general. I think that this is probably the single archetype that is worst at splashing. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking to be straight green white when I'm green white. All right, I think that's gonna cover 
all the questions and wrap us up. Thanks for hanging out. As I said, I don't know what I'm going to be talking about next week because that's going to be up to uh, my patrons in the poll. Tune in Wednesday uh, when I will be going over the next architect. Thank you and uh, goodbye for this week.